I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for my administrative law class about the doctrine of standing. It's one of the last chapters of our administrative law casebook. And here I'm just going to be give a quick recap of the basic doctrine. Hopefully you learned about this in constitutional law as well. And then I'm gonna tell you about the twist that we have on this doctrine in administrative law. Keep in mind that this is also a bar exam subject as part of constitutional law, and it comes up a lot in practice. It's very clear and can seem like a simple concept in law school. In practice, the cases are really messy and a little bit unpredictable. In con law, you may have learned this as a subset of justiciability um, uh, or which cases the courts actually can consider. And the constitutional doctrine is really about who has standing to sue. So always ask yourself that when we're talking about standing, the question is who has standing? Who is the right person to be bringing this case um, or controversy before the court? Our classic formulation of standing has three prongs, injury in fact, causation, or in modern cases, we're talking about that the injury is traceable to the challenged conduct and whether it is redressable by the courts. So if you've suffered an injury that the courts can't really do anything about, then you don't have standing to sue. Most of the cases though really focus on this question of injury in fact. If you don't know anything else about standing, you really need to know these three prongs uh, to get by and know the basics. So when we talk about injury, in fact, let's unpack this a little bit. In the Lujan case, which is in almost every administrative law casebook and most constitutional law casebooks, the Supreme Court said that an injury, in fact, ha in also has component parts. It has to be concrete and particularized and actual or imminent. So let's talk about each of those. When we talk about a concrete injury, we mean something that is real and quantifiable, not just an idea or conceptual injury or something that um, you are morally offended by or in, you're indignant over something that happened. And so we need to, to talk about like loss of revenue or loss of income or a physical injury. Show us your scars. Let us see the x-rays. Or it could be something like a loss of market share, an inability to carry out your business, uh, like let's say during a shutdown order in a pandemic or um, restrictions on your right to travel. So it can sometimes be something that's an indirect injury that indirectly affects you economic, uh, economically or in your business or your life or something like that. But it can't just be something that you found some conduct that someone did objectionable. Particularized means that the injury affects you in a special way. It's not something that affects everybody kind of the same in the world or in your country or in your state, but it affects some people more than others or some people especially, or maybe only some people, and you're one of those people. When we say actual or imminent, we mean it has happened or it's about to happen. What we don't mean by actual or imminent is something that may or may not happen at some unspecified time in the future. And so the case uh, in the Lujan case, uh, the plaintiffs were thinking about taking a trip in the future to look at certain elephants and crocodiles overseas. They didn't really have a concrete plan to do this yet um, or a date for their trip. And so the court said that's not actual or imminent, right? That's just a maybe someday problem. The same might be true if you're talking about uh, uh, merely a heightened risk of developing a medical condition or that now you used to know your risk and now it's uncertain. You're not sure if you're safe or not. And so that's going to be a little too unspecified in terms of the date when of injury for the court to want to do anything about it. Now, in some recent cases, the Supreme Court has started talking about how we also don't allow claims for generalized grievances. Personally, I don't see how this is all that different from talking about a particularized harm, but what they mean is you can't sue just because you think something is bad policy or it's bad for America, it's bad for democracy, it's bad for the country. That's a generalized grievance that's supposed to be solved through the political process. Call your congressman, um, vote on election day, but don't ask the courts to just fix the world the way you want it. 
Okay, let's move on. When we talk about causation or whether an injury is traceable, the verbiage that the Supreme Court has been using is that it's fairly traceable to the challenged conduct. Now, I do want to warn you, in practice, this factor often blurs together, either with the analysis of the injury or the discussion of whether the injury is redressable. Remember that in law, we're not talking about scientific causation the way physicists do. We're not talking about biology and medical causation or etiology, as they would say in medical school. We're talking often about who's blameworthy. It's almost more like a morality tale or who should have to incur the cost or pay to remedy something and so forth. And here the court, that's part of why they've they're moving away from saying causation and talking about, is this injury traceable to the challenge conduct? In administrative law, the challenge conduct is going to be the agency's conduct. Did the agency deny or revoke a permit or a license? Did the agency promulgate a regulation or announce a new rule or announce that they're not enforcing a particular regulation anymore? Something like that, that we have an agency action or maybe inaction or refusal to act. And then we can trace that to the actual injury that you, um, that you suffered. Now, when we talk about redressability, the way the court has been talking about this is that it's likely to be redressed by a favorable judicial decision. Again, note that in some cases, when we're talking about whether you have a real concrete and particularized injury and so forth, we're going to blur that together in a judicial opinion with the discussion about whether the courts can do anything about it. Do you have an injury that we can redress? If not, it might not be concrete and particularized. So again, in law school and for purposes of a test question, you should keep these three things straight. Be prepared though, when you're in practice as a lawyer, that judges can kind of mix them all together. And the same is to, to get uh, with mootness. Mootness is really a question of when to bring a claim. You probably studied it in conjunction with, conjunction with ripeness. And so a claim that you're bringing too late, it's too late for the court to do anything. Uh, nothing the court can do is going to fix the problem for you. That's moot. But you can also see why some courts would then think that that creates a redressability problem. And keep in mind that mootness goes a little bit more to damages and the merits and the timing of the case and is a different question than who should be bringing the case and who has standing to sue but in practice if your claim has become moot it's also unlikely that you are going to have standing to sue and as i already mentioned uh, redressability can blur together in some cases like Massachusetts versus EPA uh, with the, in the dissenting opinion with the causation analysis. Now, where did all of this come from? Well, it's really inferred from the cases and controversies requirement in Article 3 of the Constitution. And the idea is if we limit the powers of the judicial branch to actual cases and controversies, they don't get to just pontificate about political questions or make policy, then that also implies that certain people have a legitimate uh, claim or controversy and other people don't. Keep in mind, though, that in terms of the grand arc of history with our legal system, this is a bit of a newcomer, this doctrine of standing. The U.S. Supreme Court first articulated the modern doctrine of standing in 1923. That might seem like a long time ago, but it means that we've really only had a few decades of courts wrestling with what does this mean? What is an injury in fact? And so forth. And the fact is reasonable minds still differ. In one term of the U.S. Supreme Court, we might get a case about standing that's nine to nothing. Everybody agrees. It's unanimous that there is standing or no standing. And then the same term, we may get a court a decision about standing that divides on party lines, five to four or six to three, and it seems like in those cases that standing is just a smokescreen for party affiliation or policy preferences. Also keep in mind that some people believe, uh, law professors and jurists and so forth, that we should have a broad understanding of standing because we want to give more people access to the courts. So it's an access to justice concern or we want the judicial branch to be able to provide effective checks and balances against the other two branches of government when they're spinning out of control or overreaching. 
On the other hand, if you think that there are just too many lawsuits and too much litigation today, and that the courts are being activist uh, judges and so forth, then maybe you would prefer a restrictive doctrine of standing that ends up screening out a lot of cases. And so as you can see, a lot of people's sort of priors or assumptions about policy preferences. Do we have too many frivolous cases in the courts? Should people be solving their own problems or asking the other branches of government to solve their problems? They may want to invoke standing concerns a lot and other people who think we need to uh, use have the courts have more power and have more access to the courts for those who are suffering in our society they may want to sort of have a broader or looser definition of standing. Now, in administrative law, we also have this thing called the zone of interest test. And sometimes this comes up also in private claims that are based entirely on a statute where a statute has created a cause of action between private parties. In administrative law, this is practically always the case. Why? Because these cases are citizens challenging an agency's action and the agency is acting pursuant to some sort of statutory mandate or statutory delegation from Congress. And sometimes a cause of action has been created by the um, uh, their enabling statute or maybe the Administrative Procedure Act. And in that case, the injury must fall within the type of contemplated harms that the statute was hoping to address or the reason that it created a cause of action. In other words, it's conceivable that you could have a bona fide injury. Some, you were able to prove that it's concrete and particularized, that it's actual or imminent. It's not a generalized grievance. So you have that your injury is fairly traceable to the agency's action and maybe the the courts if they were going to take the case could really solve your problem but you are talking about something that's really outside the scope of that particular statute that you've brought your case under in which case you are outside the zone of interest that's a very simplified version of the zone of interest test but to be honest, the most recent Supreme Court cases about the zone of interest test have been moving in the direction of simplifying the doctrine or going full circle all the way home to the original articulation of the zone of interest in the Association of Data Processors case from the early 1970s. So they're starting to back away from decades of things like talking about prudential standing and different courts doing different things in addition to the three prongs of standing and the court now seems to be saying when there's a statute involved, we have the classic three prongs of standing and then you're going to use the tools of statutory construction to analyze the statute and figure out what's the scope what of the, the parameters or the zone of harms that the statute was hoping to create a cause of action for. And then this injury, in fact, had better fall within that zone of interest. Here's a quick review question to see if you've been paying attention. What are the three main requirements for standing? A, injury in fact, causation or traceability and redressability. Or B, jurisdiction, scope of review and liberty interest. That's supposed to be an easy question. If you're not sure about the answer, then I'm not sure you were paying attention and you should probably rewatch this video. That concludes our quick overview or recap about standing doctrine.